you so much for watching in this very special series of programs that you and I are sharing. We are both going to study and enact some very powerful, practical, and profound principles from God's Word to help you and I both develop and to experience the maximum life of spiritual joys that God wants us to have. Last week we talked about how God created each of us because of His love for us and wants to have a loving relationship with each one of His children. We also talked about how we have responsibilities to manage His creation, to do good things in life while we enjoy every day. Well, we did say towards the end of that presentation that the true joy, the true satisfaction that can come to your life can only be possible if we live in accordance with God's purposes for our lives. So that is a good question to ask. Do I value God's purposes for my life? Since my life tends to go in the direction of what I value, I believe we should value what our Creator wants us to do, lest we become unstable in all of our ways. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. As you know, being unstable is basically being inconsistent with your values and with your decisions, and that leads to trouble. Early on in society, we learn, even as kids, that it is very important to have your facts straight. It is important to be accurate in what you think and in what you say. Before you make any accusation, before you make a judgment call, before you make a decision, it's very important to make sure your facts are correct. Well, so we learn early on that the virtue of accuracy is a value in society. We've got to make sure we're correct on the details. But as we grow up, we learn that there are some other things important that could possibly conflict with certain values. And we place different values in different lists of hierarchy. For example, if a person values being right, being right in everything and letting people know it, more so than they value relationships, do you think that that would cause trouble over time? Oh, I think it does. No, it was on the left side, not the right. It was on Monday, not a Tuesday. And if they try to prove themselves accurate, even if they are over every situation, they might win a debate, a discussion, an argument perhaps, but then lose something much more important. So if we value certain things more than others, we're inconsistent and we uh, need to have our uh, priorities put in order. But on the other hand, if a person values relationships more than being right and living right, that itself is a troublesome condition, isn't it? So we look at how values are very important, but we also have to put them in perspective. There is a man named Gordon MacDonald who has a book called Ordering Your Private World. Ordering Your Private World. He tells about a friend he had who was on duty in a nuclear submarine in the Mediterranean. He says that one day there was a lot of naval traffic overhead and they had to make some quick and abrupt moves in order to avoid potential collision. Well, the uh, officer who was uh, on in charge, the captain in charge, who was in his quarters, suddenly went down to the control room and asked the people working there, is everything all right down here? Right into the very bowels of the ship, he went down and he asked, is everything all right down here? And as the question was asked, almost immediately the, duty on off the officer on duty said, Yes, sir. And then as the captain turned around and walked back up the ladder, the answer was under his breath, Everything looks all right to me, too. As I heard that illustration, I thought to myself, That's a lot about life. There's a lot of life that you can make some comparisons with this because all around us there are some things that would wreck our lives, above us, beneath us, beside us, behind us, things that would destroy our lives. But the alert captain of their soul 
doesn't just get, di uh, get distracted with all these things around. Oh no, the alert captain goes down to the control room of his life and asks the question, is everything all right down here? There is a control room of our life that the Bible calls our heart, the wellspring of life from which everything else flows. Today I want you to temporarily forget all the distractions that are around you. The maximum life is offered to everyone, no matter their circumstances, but sadly so few people find that maximum joyful life. Let me emphasize a couple key points here. It is not God's fault when we reject God's will. It is not God's fault when people reject God's will and the negative consequences that He says will come if they do, actually do come. But people often reminisce about the good old days. And I think that we do that all the time. Even I think about my childhood, which wasn't that long ago, I suppose. But even I think about the days of the past. And we might reminisce about when circumstances seemed to reflect the values that we held dear. But let me tell you this about living the Christian life. Holding to God's values and His system for life is the abundant life in Christ that is possible no matter what circumstances are around you. So I want you to be encouraged today to not get distracted with everything else around you and to focus on what's really important and ask yourself deep down in your heart, is everything truly all right down here? And of course the standard we're using to answer that question is the ultimate standard and only standard for all religious matters. That is of course God's Word, the Bible, as we discuss it today. What steers you deep down deep? You know, in the human life, in the human experience, our lives are steered and directed by something called values. Values. Why are values so important? Well, this is why values are so important. They determine your direction in life. They determine your direction. So many people are directionless in life. They don't know which way they're going. They'll just follow the crowd. They'll follow some new fad, and then when that fades away, they'll follow something else. They don't really know what they are standing for, even if they have to stand alone. In James chapter 1, verse 8, it says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We had that read just a moment ago, and we don't use that terminology very often, a double-minded man. In the Bible, actually, just a few verses earlier in James chapter 1, he talks about a person compared uh, as, a, as a buoy or just some kind of a float on the sea just being tossed by the wind. Has no power in and of itself to go anywhere. They're just following the waves of life. Well, a double-minded man or a double-minded woman is as described. With someone who is unsure of their values. That's what a double-minded person is. Someone who is unsure of their values. We have a whole, not just a generation, but a whole society seems like today that is going nowhere close to experiencing the maximum life in Christ because they have no idea what their values truly are. One of the purposes of this series is to help you find and fulfill God's purposes for your life. And we truly need to let our lives be a glory to Him. And in the process, we find what that maximum life is by living in accordance with our ultimate created purpose. Gallup, about 15 to 20 years ago, did a study on the baby boom generation. And he says the biggest trouble facing the baby boom generation, and as a result, subsequent generations that follows, is not lack of money, it's not lack of time, it's not even relational conflict. He says the most important uh, conflict of this generation and this society, the most uh, uh, the struggle of society, that which causes the most stress, is that we have a whole group of people living by what he calls incongruent values. Incongruent values. Basically, incongruent values mean they say one thing and they live something else. They say one thing and they live something else. What words come to your mind when I give you that description or that definition? Inconsistency? Shall I say hypocrisy? Let me tell you a little secret. Hypocrisy is not actually a function of religion. It's a function of humanity. There's not a single person who is as consistent as we ought to be. 
But as we try to live by God's values, we become, quote, perfected in the sense that we are completely living by what God wants us to be. We say that family is very important. That's a value. Wouldn't you agree? Family is valuable. But people say that, and yet studies show that children live in an existence where maybe two or three minutes a day comprises uninterrupted time with their parents. Two to three minutes a day, and yet we say family is important. But then the parents might worship their careers. Some values that are incongruent there, you see. Some people say things like, well, my health is important to me. My health is important, and health is important to everyone, no doubt. But some people don't value it as much as they should until they lose it. For example, people may say, oh, health is important to me, but do you eat right? Do you put the good things into your body that you know it needs? Do you put toxins into your body that you know it doesn't need? Do you sleep well? Do you get enough sleep? Do you overwork? Do you rest? You see, so many things show that maybe what we say we value, we don't show it in our lives like we really should. We say that materialism is bad, focusing on just having possessions instead of relationships in life, and, and yet we say that most people are up to here by choice in debt, trying to keep up with the Joneses down the street. You see, we have competing values, and Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says that, well, um, you guard your heart. You guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Or you guard your affection, for from out of that, everything else flows or is influencing everything else in life. What you value determines the direction of your life. Every decision you make is based upon your values at that time. So I think it's very important to clearly define what is most important to you in your life, and more importantly, what should be most important to you. So one of the reasons that values are so important is that they not only determine your direction, but if they determine your direction, they also determine your destiny in life. If my values chart the course, that also means that they dictate where I will end up. Did you know that you spend your time doing what you value? If you don't like it very much, you're probably not going to put much time or effort into it. Certainly if you don't feel the need to, if you don't value it at all, you're not going to do it. You value what you spend your life doing. Your values are the axle from which everything else in your life revolves around. So the next question I want to ask you is, where do I get my values? You know, sometimes values are embedded uh, into us because of society and because of our circumstances and influence. But do we ever sit down and determine the values that we are supposed to acquire and live by? Where do we get our values? Well, it comes down to one of two sources. You either get your values from Christ and studying His Word to know what His value system is, or you get your values from culture. Another way to say it is, you either get your values from the world or from the Word. Either from the Word or from the world. Those are the two main places. The Greeks call it the cosmos, and that refers in this case to culture. And culture and Christ seem to always conflict, of course. If you want to know the surest way to determine what culture values, just watch a 15-second commercial. In 15 seconds, that commercial will try to appeal to what they think you value in order to sell their product or service. I think it's very interesting. You want to know what society values? Society values, number one, pleasure. We are a very sensual society. It is a billion, billion dollar industry. It, uh, it generates more income than any other industry. The pleasure industry. Hey, we live by a society that says if it feels good, do it. That's the expression of the value. They value pleasure and they say if it feels good, do it. Now, we mentioned last time in our previous session that uh, we are supposed to enjoy life and it gives glory to God when we live in accordance to His will to enjoy the things as He uh, has uh, uh, said and determined for us to enjoy. But if we say that value, uh, pleasure is our value, then we are in trouble. But society values pleasure. They also value possessions. Possessions. We have this idea that says that the person with the most toy wins, or with the best toy is the most popular. And that's conditioned in uh, young children's minds early on, that possessions is where it's at. But they need to be taught otherwise. It's not about the possessions. 
It's about the relationship with Christ. Sometimes we are consumed with consuming. It's kind of funny to say it this way. We are a society that believes in the uh, um, life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. Life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. We think that if we have it all, then, then, then we're the most happy. But that's not the case at all. Society is teaching us so forcefully that the person's worth is equal to their net worth. And that is far from truthful. The third thing that, val uh, that society values is power or prestige or shall I say positions. P positions of the world that people look up to and, and think, wow, you're so lofty and high and exciting and, and I want that. They seem to have it all together. But of course, even they themselves begin to experience the emptiness if they have put their values in those things. And now that they have those things, they realize, like Solomon did in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, that's not where it's at. That's not where it's at. Sometimes commercials appeal to our sense of wanting to feel in control and powerful. You see the person getting behind the wheel of a car, gripping it tightly, and then speeding off into the distance with a cloud of dust behind, and it has things like own the road coming at the end of the commercial. They make you feel like you are in charge if you just go into debt buying this car, right? Well, that's not the approach to take. Getting control of your life is going down deep into the control room of your very soul and asking myself, what are my values? Now, contrary to popular opinion, God is not against all of these things. God is not against you ex uh, experiencing pleasures and having possessions and even being granted the blessing of privileges of positions in this life. He's not against those things. But what God does say is, these cannot be your values. Instead, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I think a good synonym for God's kingdom is just His value system. If in your heart you seek God's will first and only, then all these things will be provided to you. That's a very interesting passage that I'm going to share in just one moment. But right now I want to turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 is the inspired wording of what we just talked about on the screen. John says in verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything that is of the world, the perversions of all these things, Satan's system, no, don't follow his ways, the perversion of all those things in the world are the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has or does. Now the King James Version, and I like how this word, uh, words it very well, it's the three things of life that are sinful. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's it right there. That's the three bars from which Satan hangs all of his customized disguises on to get you to sin and go against God because he can't tolerate sin in his presence and Satan wants you to sin and as a result, be moved away from God. Satan is your enemy. God wants to redeem you by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is the description of sin right here. And that's what the world values. It's kind of sad that the things that are of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is what the world values. The positions, the pleasures, and the positions of life. But it doesn't have to be that way for you. Proverbs 21, 21 says... The person who pursues righteousness and love finds life and prosperity and honor. Notice that life, prosperity, and honor are the blessings to you if you pursue first God's righteous plan for your life. This is incredible for him to say, If you seek me first, God says, then I will give you the things that the world craves, but in its truest form. Don't praise the value system of culture. Praise the value system of Christ. The third question of our time together today is this. How do I set my life on solid foundations, pillars of values that will last for eternity? How do I build my life on lasting values? I think it's as easy as A, B, C. As ABC, first of all, you have to assess what is most important in life. 
You have to assess what's most important. Job 34 verse 4 says, Let us discern together what is right. Let us learn what is good. Before you and I can do what is good, we have to first know what is good. And that's where we study God's Word. And then we see that it is truly most important. And then we make it most important in our lives. What do I value? Television influences kids a lot more than adults, it seems, and a lot more than the parents. And that's so sad. But it's not just kids that are influenced by television if it's misused. It's also the adults. You and I are influenced by other people broadcasting things all the time that begin to wear on us. And after a while, doesn't even affect us, doesn't even bother us. And that means that we are living out a value system that we didn't even choose. And that's not too bright. I encourage you to sit down and decide for yourself what is most important in my life and write out your definition of success. My definition of success is living out godly values. Living out godly values in my life. That is a success. Doesn't matter where I come from. Doesn't matter how much money I've got in the bank. Doesn't matter my ethnicity. If I live out God's values for my life, that makes me a success. And if it's built on Christ, that means that the success that God gives you is eternal and will always last forever. Now I have a question for you. Have you done that? Have you taken the time to sit down and determine what is most important in your life? That's what we've got to do. But after you assess what's most important, then what happens is step number two. Bail out what's not important. Bail out what's not important at all. There are a lot of things that you can waste your time with, even things that are maybe pleasurable and fun, but there are so many things that will steal your time. The options of that which will rob your time have never been more prevalent in society, it's more prominent because there are millions of things that you could waste your time doing. And quite honestly, there are some things that, even if you had all the time in the world, are just not worth doing anyway. In Psalm 119, verse 37, is a very powerful verse that says, Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. I think that that should be printed on every television frame and on every uh, uh, tabloid rack in every store across this country. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Now, I know that there are things that maybe don't accomplish any greater purpose, but they give you some recreation and fun, and that's okay. There is a time in life for recreation, but don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't, uh, don't give way to letting the things that you enjoy take up all of your time and distract you from what you're supposed to be about. Which, of course, if it's in accordance with your purposes and talents in life, as we will discuss next week, your talents, then you are motivated to do those things that are most valuable. Ask yourself, are you living out what you value? I encourage you to get a blank sheet of paper and ask yourself these two questions and then fill in some blanks underneath. Question number one, what do I want to accomplish in my life? What are maybe the top five things that I want to accomplish in my life? And then fill in some of those answers. And then ask yourself, what do I want to be remembered for most in my life? And then you will have a very core list of some of your principal values to live by. Paul, of course, went through this activity. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 says, Everything else is worthless to me when compared to the price of gain in knowing Christ. There is a man who knew his value system, and everything in his life was shaped around those core values. That's what he spent his time doing, and that's what he is remembered for, and even helps so many millions to this very day. Assess what's most important. Bail out what's not. Their man named Tony Campola has a book and he titled it, Who Switched the Price Tag? He went to people who were 90 years old and he asked them one question. What would you do with your life differently if you had a chance to live it over again? And the consensus answer among all of them were things like this. I would live my life doing things that would outlast me. I would not just live for myself, I would serve a higher purpose and cause. 
Isn't that very telling? If you live and value pleasure, if you live for and you value pleasure the most, to live is pleasure, then to die would mean that you don't have it anymore. To live is possessions, if you put that word possessions in that blank, to live as possessions, then that means that your happiness will be gone when it rusts, tears up, breaks, or gets stolen. If living for positions is what you value most, then you'll have happiness only as long until someone else brighter, smarter, or more conniving than you comes and steals it away from you. But Paul was the one who said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's, of course, in the, the words of Philippians chapter 1. Verse, 20, uh, verse 2 and 21. And I think about all that Paul has written, and he certainly could say that in his life. He backed it up. Can you also say, for me to live is Christ? Is that what you're living for? Or to die is gain? I think when we assess our values, we have to then bail out what's not important and realize that Christ takes the preeminent seat in my value system. If you spend your time reading God's Word, you have a pretty good handle on what Christ is all about and what I should be all about. It's not about money. It's not about pleasure. It's not about power. But to live is Christ, and that's the only answer that can fit in that blank that results in that beautiful blessing of eternal joy and gain forever in heaven. Christ takes the preeminent seat. But I'm going to ask you a couple questions right now. As you have looked at your heart, maybe in this discussion, is everything all right down there? Is everything all right in the very essence of your being? And we know that there are some things that are just not quite right as they should be. We say that Christ is at the head of the list. For me, Christ is most important. We want Him as our Savior. But do we live our life as though He is our Lord? So many people cannot say that. And there's that incongruent value system that we talked about again. Let me tell you what success is. As I've already mentioned, if you're just watching this program perhaps, I encourage you to write down the definition of success that I have so that I can feel joyous every day. Success is living out your value system in Christ. Christ is because only He is where true value can be found. No one comes to the Father except through Him because Jesus Christ is the Word of God incarnate in the flesh who came to earth to die for our sins so that we, by the faith response of obedience to the gospel and a life of faithfulness to His will, allows us to receive the grace that saves us each and every day. So this session together, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've discussed a lot of important things about our value system, and I've given you a couple of assignments. I want you to write down five things that are most important in your life. I want you to write down five things that you would like to be remembered for most after your life has gone upon this earth. And then I want you to consider how much time you spend doing various things this week. I want you to keep track of your time in one week. And then at the end of that week, I want you to put the things that you've written and how long it's taken to do them right beside what you say you value and ask yourself, am I living out what I say that I value most? And then at the end of the, all of this, you ask yourself the question, how can I better live in accordance with God's purposes for my life? And the answer is, simply open up the Bible, start reading from the pages of God's Word, what He would have you to be, and how it would have you to think, and to behave, and treat other people. And as a result of all of this, you will be well on your way to experiencing the maximum life as a child of His. Tune in next time as we share a discussion referring to what your specific talents are and how to find so many more that you never knew you had.